Good morning, everyone. Good morning. This is my great pleasure to be here today. Um, I am from the University of São Paulo in Brazil, and uh, I work for the Department of Animal Science for the last 35 years, where I'm responsible for the forage conservation. We, this is a part of the grassland team of the university, and then uh, we are on the track for this. Uh, career. For those of who which are willing to be my friend, this is my WhatsApp. So if we can grab it, I will be available later on to further discussions, okay? Uh, first, I would like to acknowledge two of my colleagues. I'm very proud about them, Dr. Diogo Costa and Dr. Danilo Souza. Uh, they were working in our college before and I'm very proud to see them here doing a very good job in Australia. And also I'd like to acknowledge another two students from my, my group that helped me out to put this presentation today. Uh, as I already said, I just would, I would like to highlight the benefit of having the government, the universities and the companies all together supporting a strategy on discussion. This is, would be very interesting to replicate more times in other issues. This is a very interesting way to have a very high level discussion. I hope we can keep up with this and thanks for all the partners we are supporting here today. I'm here today with you but uh, <coughs> I'd like to acknowledge the group of my lab. This is a kind of old picture about five years ago the, but the, the background is our college which is a uh, the College of Agriculture at the University of Sao Paulo. First of all, I would like to let you know that most of the livestock production in Brazil was evolved in the last of the two or three decades because we learned how to handle and manage animals in the pasture condition. This became a very professional thing in Brazil. And because of that, the forage conservation came after as, as a need to make the supplementation of the animals due to the seasonality on the fortune. So all the dairies and most of those pictures are regarding the dairy systems in Brazil. They are based upon on the grazing during the summer and the summer conservation for the winter time, which is also the dry time in Brazil. And most of the times corn silage, uh, maize silage or sorghum silage, they are kind of the typical solutions in the country. The thing that I'm facing recently, traveling in many other countries, as after the COVID, that we are under a kind of international crisis on the intake or the uptake of animal products, both dairy and meat. There is a kind of a surplus in the world nowadays in both of them. We are trying to catch up and overcome this. This is typical here in Australia, but it's also true in Brazil, in China, and other countries. And every time when we visit those farmers, there is someone asking which kind of costs should I cut off? And this is a very interesting time in the history because we have to pay attention if we are cutting the right costs. There is a risk that I'm cutting costs is related with the, the golden eggs. And today I'm here to try to make your mining looking towards this. What is the golden eggs as far as the forage conservation? What are the things that we could have replaced in the system or the ones that we have to be certainly doing this in a better way? So. Uh, I hope that today I'll have time enough to show you some of these suggestions on reduce your expenses. But for now and now, just keep this in mind. The forage yield and the quality is by far the most effective tool to decrease the costs of milk and meat and overcome the crisis at the farm level. So everything that I can do to produce the forage in a more efficient way, this might be one of the very smart strategies to overcome the crisis. 
Okay, I will talk about the corn savage management, but if you have any questions later on with other special forages, I'll be more than glad to discuss with you. This is the reducing costs. And then I will give you a picture from, from one very typical beef feedlot in Brazil and the size of the feedlots and the demands. This, for instance, is, is, a, is a beef feedlot with 80,000 animals in a very typical agricultural land area in Brazil. So the demand for silage acknowledgement, what is also called the silage science in the country, is increasing every, every year. And then we developed a model to try to understand what would be the real benefit over the investment for every step, every single step. Ever since I start with the forage yield by deciding the varieties and all the changes that I can have in the forage composition that, that might be a, um, a driven force to change the animal performance as far as the energy, the pharmaceutical compounds which are inside of the forage or the molecules which are there, the enzymes and everything that we know on the forage composition that might be a change changing on the offering of energy and protein to the animals. And then we come up with the next stage when I have the harvesting. I will, I will not go through one by one because it will take a lot of time, but I just want you to understand that silage production is a sequence of a multifactorial system that I have to pick up every step of the system and try to be efficiently. That's the reason why many, many of the farmers, they, they do some steps in a good way and some steps they need to go over to learn more on that. And today, I hope we can help you on understanding some of those aspects. But remember one thing, the return on investment is based on multiple variables. This is bad news for us. It's easier to take care about things they have not too many variables. When I have many variables, it's more difficult to control. So it requires you to have some of the competence at the farm level and some of those competence for the surrounding system that is helping you and supporting you in the farm which means all the companies and all the universities which are surrounding you, they will give you the right support to try to avoid mistakes in every step. And those steps, they are related with many variables. And the, last, the, the, the two least one, they were the new ones. By far, in the last 30 years, I would guess, Animal performance was a, the best way to measure if the strategy was a positive strategy or not, by weight gain or milk yield or milk composition. However, when we go through now the meat composition, the quality and the traits and the traceability, this became very important. And nowadays we are also being pushed because of the environmental issues. So all this together will give us a chance to understand if our movement in the farm is in the right way or not regarding the forage composition. For that, the only way to measure that is by certification. There are some uh, governmental and some other structures they are establishing in the countries to do the certification or doing by the PDCA. PDCA means I will do, I will plan, I will do, I will check and I will arrange again by changing this in a better way. And the pro profitability and the society added values are together with that. Okay, I just brought you a very simple example on how to handle this in a very easy way to reduce costs at the farm level. This is a typical arrangement when I have here in the left side a typical corn silage with a TDN established of 66% and then I have about 53% of NDF in the composition and 10% crude protein. In this right side I have what I call the replacement corn silage which is a result of a lot of different management 
including the choices of our rights and the management and the, all the harvesting procedures. As you can see here, the most important benefit is the overall digestible energy here, which will have an input from 66 to 74. And this is completely achievable. This is important to tell you. This is not nothing that is only regarding to the research institutes or university. A very good farms in the world, they will achieve this or even more than that. Okay? And this will give you less fiber and much more starch because in a, a general basis what we are doing here is producing corn silage with more corn inside, more grains, more kernel. Uh, this will make a important, e efficient way to have a better quality on this. And then I will try to give you a simulation how important it is to have a very good corn silage in the way to, m to reduce your costs in the farm. And then I will start with the, the, the last statement that if I do this in the right way, I will have a five less percent milk cost uh, changing from a medium to a high, high quality corn silage. And how is it possible? In that, in that sense, here you can see the medium quality is about a 50% NDF, 7.5 crude protein, 26%. We are using this for a typical 600 body weight uh, host and cow, producing 32 kilos and 3.6 as a milk fat. And we just uh, assumed here some of the costs of your typical ingredients, 100 American dollars per ton of a fresh, fresh matter, soybean close to 500, ground corn 350, and minerals and vitamins close to 1,000. Maybe this is not a, exactly the same relationship of the cost that you have here, but the idea is here. And in this size, you have what I call as a high quality corn silage with 35, 32 on, on the starch and 45 as uh, NDF. Okay, when we do the formulation here, as you can see, the first thing that is important on this is as a percentage of the dry matter, I'm including more corn silage compared with this one here. This is not much more than four to five percentage units on, the, on this diet, but because this forage is also produced in a more efficient way, the cost of this is lower. And then by doing the overall formulation, you can see that we are using less concentrate you are losing a little bit more soybean to compensate, but the overall, this was the cost for a kilogram of milk with this one here, which gives you 5% less. So, I'm not here today to deliver this to you because this is very simple. I'm sure you have seen this many times before. However, in the, under the crisis, what I have learned in my career, the typical and the most simple choices are the ones that will make us the best way to uh, overcome the problem. This is another situation that I just faced this by living in China when we were comparing, on the other hand, the combination of forages in the diet. In that sense, in this way, in this, in this side here, I have alfalfa hay. In, in, in the case of China, we have this as a um, internal production of, and also the importation of, of alfalfa hay and this was the cost of alfalfa hay very high close to the same price of the soybean meal and then this is the high quality corn silage again so when you compare a diet when you, you add some of the high quality corn silage and alfalfa hay together to supply the, the needs of energy and protein this would be the cost for milk compared with this one here, with as a high, corn, a high quality corn silage, and this would be your reducing in the cost. With this message, I can tell you this. Let's make it this simple. Sometimes we don't need to have extra forage. Extra forage should be used if this is very reasonable and important to reduce costs. If I don't need that, if I can supply the diet with only one forage source, and that is the way to make a reduction in the cost and keeping the animal in a good health system, 
That's the, the reason why I'm presenting this to you today. That's to make this simple. Sometimes I'm facing situations where the, the farmers, they are reluctant and changing the diet because in some way they believe they need some sorting of a different force in the diet. And this is more than welcome if they are bringing you a reduction in the costs. Other than that, we don't need this decision. Okay, okay. now I'm, I will move to another thing. I'm, I'm afraid to run, uh, run out of the time here. This is, I'm using a typical Chinese trial, but uh, this is the same that you probably have here in many other areas when we are deciding about what, where is the best time to have uh, the harvesting uh, of the maize or the corn for silage. And this is the growth period, this trial. They have a track in this, and then this is the one one-fourth of the milk line, half of the milk line, and here more than half of the milk line, and this is the evolution. The, bio, the biomass production, which is typical increasing on the synthesis, and in this way is the water content was is decreasing across the time. And that, as well, uh, as you already know, the crude protein content is decreasing because the leaves and the stems, they have a little bit more protein then the, the kernel by itself the kernel is increasing you will increase the starch content but uh, you decrease the, cr the protein content in the forage and then you you see the water soluble carbohydrates after the peak there is also a decrease and the fiber is also decreasing by adding more kernel in the dry matter and as you can see here, the NDF is also following the same pattern. As the time goes by, I have less fiber and I have more starch. This is the typical trading off in most of the cereals. This is true for corn, for sorghum, for oats, for wheat, and all the winter cereals which are being used for that. So if you look here, this is the milk yield per ton of dry matter. This is an equation that is estimating how much milk you can produce per ton of dry matter. As you can see here, the peak was achieved in between one fourth and a half of a, a milk line. And again, when I calculate here the milk per hectare, which is the different thing, is a combination of the animals being fed per hectare multiplied by the nutritive value of that forage again. I have the best results in the later stages of this trend. So if you decide to harvest before that, you very probably are losing money. So we have to keep up with this late stage of harvesting in order to be harvesting the best benefit on optimization from this culture. This is a good solution also for other cultures. This is the milk per hectare again, as you can see, we are following almost the same pattern. We have the optimization here in the late stages of this. In Brazil, we do the same, right? This is the map from one of the, the forage trials that we have a kind of a networking in different states. We do a kind of a variety of comparison in many states in the country. And this is published every year and is offered as an app display to take the final decision. Which, which one would be the best varieties to be harvested for corn? Every year we have a trial in different states. From 19, uh, 2018, we completed 30 years doing this, and then we, we launched this uh, forage guide to be followed by our farmers. And this is a typical variety um, uh, evaluation. I'm pretty sure you have something similar here in Australia. And this is the typical display when I have the nutritive value of milk per ton and the ranking. The darker is the green, the better position I have for a certain variety. And this is the top 10 hybrids for silage that every year we offer this by different regions. And uh, this is just interesting here. This is the size of the cycle. 129 days, the average 131. You see here many companies and universities participating together on this. 
This is the typical biomass production, close to 50 tons per hectare. It, it is equal to 19 tons of a dry matter. This is the typical dry matter content, close to 37. And the crude protein, close to 8. Starch, close to 31. NDF, close to 40. And this is the milk yield, estimated in kilos of milk per ton, 1.8, and the kilos uh, per hectare, close to 33. So these indicators are an easy way to decide which one would be the best variety for that. So now we have to try to understand what are the changes on the management that might, might change your final decision. Uh, for that, I'm using as an illustration another trial. This trial was trying to optimize the growth of corn for silage by using some uh, combinations of uh, nitrogen uh, uh, together with the forage density. And this is interesting. We have a 60, 80, and 90,000 plants per hectare, and we were combining 250, 230, and 310 kilos of nitrogen per hectare. Most of the good results will, will are blue, which represents the medium and the highest level of nitrogen. And this is again from the dry biomass. As you can see here, the drier biomass are in between 200 with the highest density, or this 300 with this density. Uh, this is interesting here, as you can see, the total starch production was maximized here in this combination of 80,000 plus 230 or 310. And the relative feeding value that integrates all the variables from the dry matter, it gave us the best solution when I have about 80,000 close to 230 and 310. So I use those data from this trial, which is very useful for you too. I offer this data, the raw data, by using the system called the MILK24, just released by the Wisconsin University in US. And this estimates as a standard the 1,600 kilos per ton or 50,000 kilos per hectare and this would give us the lowest cost of a ton per kilogram of a dry matter. As you can see here, the best results per ton would be achieved here, milk per ton, and the best responses in milk per hectare were achieved here. Uh, if we combine together the medium density and high density with the medium level and high level nitrogen, they would close to the best solution. And this would be very interesting to you too as a tool to make a final decision. So now I move forward to another issue which means how high would be the cutting on the harvesting? Should I harvest this very close to the soil level or should I harvest this in an upper height to avoid all the lignin and the soil contamination and all the issues which are pushing us to increase the height of harvesting. This is, we do have in many trials, but this one here is very interesting because this is, this is a result of a meta-analysis that was also published in the Dairy Science in 2019. We have four different heights. 15, 30, 45, and 60 centimeter. And for every one centimeter increase, this is the typical relationship that we have for all these traits in the dry matter. For the dry matter, as a percentage of fresh matter, as I increase it from 15 to 60 centimeter, I increase 0.09 unit percent of the dry matter. So the dry matter is increasing because I have more kernels in the mix, the higher is the height of cutting. In the opposite range, as we're increasing the height, we were decreasing the NDF because I have a less 
lignin and less fiber, less digestible fiber composition. And following this, the same pattern, you can see here the starch is increasing also from 0 0.08 units per, per start for every centimeter increase in the height. And NDF, as a digestible NDF, as a percentage of the overall NDF was uh, increased. So the NDF became a little bit more digestible, which means in the bottom part of the plant I have the lower, lower, the lowest digestible NDF over there. And finally, this is very interesting. If I increase the height here, you can see the milk yield per ton is increasing as completely expected. I have more starch, less fiber. However, when I improve this height, I also decrease the amount of milk what, which was being decreased. So, pay attention to this because this is a very sensitive case. If you are following a pattern, they are paying you for quality on the milk or things like this on the market is in a situation the market is very positive. You might take a decision based on this, but nowadays, in many cases in the world, more and more, this is the smartest decision. You have to push your decision to cut, to cut, to cut this plant in the lower height, trying to recover the most part of this. And why is that? Animals, and usually the dairies, they do not respond positively for the benefit on the increasing on quality as far as you can expect it for. So all the forage that you are leaving behind, you making you losing money, okay? We have done recently some trials in China. I have been living in China for the last two years. And we have done some trials across the country. And here I can share you some data regarding the packing. Uh, let me see if it's working here. This is a trial that we have a target, the maximum packing, in order to achieve the higher density in the silo. Because we know the higher is the density, the lower are the losses in the silo. So this silo you are seeing a lot of equipment packing over there together almost all together and for some of you I'm sure you see oh this is too much no this is not too much this is the amount of packing that I need to reach at least 700 kilos per cubic meter and this is a very important target to avoid losses so in many farms we found that the density was not being reached by either a lower packing effort, I have less packing than I should have, and also I was having particles too big. The chopping length was big, too big for having a, a very high in the silo. And here I will bring you together for one thing, just to keep in mind. Even though we are targeting the animals, before the animals we have to understand the silo. The silo needs are not the same needs as the animal needs. Not too many people know that. Everybody understands that everything that I'm doing in the silo is because the animal needs are there. This is not completely true. The silo needs a very small particle to make a very high packing, a higher density, taking the oxygen out and making the system very tight and sealed to preserve the energy as much as possible. Later on, later on, I will try to match those requirements, the chopping length with the animal needs. And that's what I'm trying to show you next. But by far, just remember this, this is one of very typical failure Eventually, in the dairy farms, the chopping length is too big. And this is resulting in you typically to have 100 kilos less per cubic meter and increasing the losses in the silo from the 10%, which is our goal, to 20%. 20% losses means that every ton that you have in the silo, 200 kilos will go to the atmosphere as CO2. Okay. This is a loss that you are not seeing that. You just account this if you measure it. 
everything that go goes inside of the silo and everything that out of the silo and almost no farmers are well organized to have this very very well established and accountable so many people they don't believe in losses in the silos because they don't see the losses but if you are measuring everything that comes into the silo that goes out of the silo you realize that you are losing a lot of the dry matter to the atmosphere and your silage by the end will be more costly. Okay, by considering this, what should we do? We should measure the density in the silo. This is what we, we have done in China. We, de we've, we developed the system that we do this in a real time. Meanwhile, the tractors are packing. I'm taking samples those samples will be calculated immediately on the density and the density is being offered is being reached it's good otherwise i'll bring you more packing and now we are developing an electronic system that will measure the pressure without this system here i will have a, a real-time measurement in a sensor that is inside of the silage the sensor will give me outside the measure of the density and this will be the future, because I can see, I can arrange, I can improve the packing. Meanwhile, the packing is going on. This is not a thing that I will realize six months later, if I have done a good packing or not. I can pretty much follow this in real time and changing things over there during the time I'm in the silo, doing the silage. Okay? So, one of the things that is also involved with the packing is the sharpening of the knives and the rose distance. Very hard because some of these times we have to talk with the contractors or the customize the service of harvesting. In some countries this is part of the farm crew, in some other countries this is a completely out of service that comes from outside. And because of the customizers, uh, harvesters, they are trying to having a very good uh, uh, throughput and uh, they are trying to harvest as quicker as possible. This is a thing that usually has to be deal in between we and them. How fine are the shopping size and how is the distance in between the rows to have a very good shopping. This is a not very shopping as you hear you can have a lot of large particles in the 1.9 millimeter tray. And here, this is a good service of a shopping when you have a better solution for that. And this is the improvement. How much this was before in the 19 millimeter sieve and this after the sharpening of the knives. And this is the percentage of the kernels that are present in the 4.75 millimeters 57 and here 70 percent. This is closer to the one that I am assuming to be a very good silage. As you see some of those decisions they are not related at all with the costs. This is just a matter of discipline. I'm not talking about to put more money or less money on that. This is just a decision of discipline in the farm. In the case of a corn silage, many of those decisions are related with the discipline. This is that the digestibility with the cracker or without the cracker, which is a kind of a display, a device a typical from the harvest, when I can break the corn inside. The big difference in between 28 and 36 percent of the dry matter is for the ones that have the cracker and have the chance of breaking the corn. We have to remember that uh, some of the slides that we have done before, we were deciding to harvest this culture later on, a little bit later, because I have a lot of benefits on harvesting later. But the later I harvest, I have a more challenge on breaking the grain or breaking the corn. So here, that was run by Professor Kung from Delaware and Richard Muck from Wisconsin. From 50 to 60 or from 60 to 70, this is a kind of a, about one kilo increase only, only by having a better kernel processing on the silage. So again, this is more discipline than uh, investment by itself. 
This is another trial that we just, I will finish this, my presentation with this trial. Mr. Chairman, I'm running to the end of my presentation. This trial was uh, run by our group in Brazil. We published this in, on the Dairy Science in 2020. And this was a, tr a trial that was put up to measure the benefit of having smaller particles in the silage and comparing the type of harvest that we have available in the country. So the PT6 means the pool type corn silage harvester. It's a kind of old thing for you here in Australia for sure, but in Brazil we still have many farmers running the harvesting by using pool type, pool type machines for harvesting. And it was calibrated with a six millimeter, very small particles for that kind of equipment. And then the other three combinations here, they were called the self-propelled, which is typical from the customized harvesting. And in that sense, we have a one millimeter distance in between the rows, but we have uh, three combinations here, six millimeter as average, 12 millimeters or 18 millimeters. How good would be the performance of the dairy cows if we have uh, different types of equipment and the smaller and the larger part? The diet was the same, pretty much the same. A typical diet of 44% NDF, 31% starch, and then we were um, measuring on the 19 millimeter screen, 9% retention, and here, 4, 9.8, and 90. So according to these regulations on the device, I have an increase on the particle size in this bigger tray. Okay, what do we have here? This is the composition of the diet. Corn silage, about 50%. I have a con some, some concentrates represented by citrus pulp, finally ground corn, soybean, and the, the mixture with some minerals. This was the combination, as I mentioned to you before, 6, 12, and 18. And this was the NDF again for the diet, 29, 28, 28 again. And then the uh, effective fiber retained on the 8 millimeter screen, which is very typical marker, 17, 15, 17, 17. They, this is a kind of a goal for all these trials. Okay, so what about the intake from the cows? Almost no change, as you can see here. There is no statistical difference. The cows were eating close to 19 to almost to 20 kilos, but there was no, no trend towards the intake. Ta intake is considered the same. However, the milk production was a kind of a very, very classical uh, trying to trend from the PT6 to SP6, we have 1.2 kilos increase. So from the pool type to the uh, self-propelled in the same size, I increase 1.2 kilos, even by using smaller particles. So. Now, I have it to remind you, don't be afraid on having the smaller particles. This is a very typical thing. This is the increase on milk yield. This was the decrease on milk yield when we were, we were achieving the very, very hi uh, highest uh, uh, particle size of 18 millimeters. This is the feed efficiency. Feed efficiency was also optimized because the intake was the same, but milk yield was a kind of a uh, uh, curve, a slope on that. So we have this uh, trine of a quadratic effect. You see, you have a, again a statistical difference for increase in the feed efficiency. And then our first measurement that was showing the rooming was being much better way uh, utilized. This trial has a lot of uh, internal measurements at the rooming level, but uh, here you can see one of a very good one, which is the mercury nitrogen is decreased. It means the coupling of energy and protein in the rooming is 
moving towards in the way that we have a, a optimization of uh, the protein synthesis in the rumen. So we, which means we, we are doing a, in a very better way. The star digestibility was increased and is also statistically uh, significant, as you can see here, by two or three percent units. And this was kept for in between 60 and 12. When we reached the 18, it was too much again. Uh, the start digestibility was decreased. And then how can we see that is going to be effective for the animal? By measuring the plasma glucose. The plasma glucose, again, was giving us a peak of more energy available on the 6 and then 12. So here was lower, and here was lower result again. Rumination time. This is one of the very important measurements on the chewing behavior that made, made us to take the final decision on that. As you can see here, by using this six self-propellant six millimeter, we decreased the, sharply the rumination time, which means the animals were lacking of effective fiber here. And then we have to be aware that could be a risk of acidosis. Okay. And then we move towards the chewing time, the chewing time which takes in account the rumination and the eating time together, they was also decreased. All the data are following the same pattern. And then we look to the part particle sorting. That might be one of the reasons. Animals could be sorting the very high particles and choosing the small ones, and that gives us the lacking of effective fiber. And that's what happened when you look here to this SP6. We have 97.5, so animals were searching for higher particles because they have too, main, too few large particles in the system, and then this was significant. And then we use the markers for subacute acidosis. So there are some metabolites that are pretty much following this. As you can see here, there is a higher level of delactate and also some of the seroamyloid A and this was a trend for giving us a chance those animals were risky on the acidosis as well here, even though it was not a significant, but it was a 6.10. We have a 6 compared with the others, so both them are giving us the trend for the acidosis. So based on that, we just decided to keep the 12 as a target. So for these cows with 30, 35 kilos a day, about 20 kilos of intake, 12 millimeters as a soul, the unique forage in the diet, this was good enough to keep up with the forage quality and the same time the animal health. And then it makes us to get backwards to the silo. And this is the, the regulation that we do in the silo. Meanwhile, we are harvesting the forage. We are trying to keep the animals in a condition with the 12 as a maximum average size for harvesting the forage. I have more data here, but uh, I'm, uh, I run out of the time. I will be more than glad to share with you the other data. Uh, I think my final words related with this presentation today is most of the things that will reduce the cost on the silage are related with the very simple decisions at the farm level. Some of them, again, they are not re representing investment. They are representing discipline. And then this is a, a very good way to keep up with the uh, milk production based on the, the very efficient uh, silage production. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. I overruled the, my time here. I hope it's not jeopardizing all the organization, but it, it's again my great pleasure to be here today. It's a, a unique experience for me. This is my first time in Australia. I would like to acknowledge all of you for all the hospitality and the kindness with me. I'm very touched with this very nice country you have here. Thank you very much.